so uh, a guy comes to his mother and said, Mother, after 40 years, I finally decided to get married. And the mother is very excited, and she said, I would love to meet your future wife. Please bring her over for dinner, maybe next Friday night. The guy is very excited. He said, OK. He said, you know, mother, over the last three years, I dated three other women. Why don't I bring all of them for dinner? And let's see if you can guess which is the one I'm going to marry. <laughs> the mother is very excited about this idea. The guy is excited. They all come to dinner. The mother talks to one, the second, the third, the fourth. After about an hour of discussion, she points to one of them and said, this is the one. This is the one you're going to marry. And the guy said, mother, I'm, I'm so shocked. I'm surprised. How did you know? What, what gave it away? He said, I loved all of these women. I admire all of them. I'm friends with all of them. This is the one I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. What was the thing about it that gave it, make it so clear for you? And the mother looks at him and says, it's the only one I hate. <laughs> this is, I guess, another way of saying I'm Jewish. Uh, <laughs> So I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of how I think about uh, research. And I'm not sure it's uh, creative. I think it's uh, maybe anti-creative. But I just want to describe kind of the process a little bit. And I want to describe it in the area of thinking about how are ex Here, some people are leaving already. This is it? I just started? Um, I figured now not many other people. <laughs> would leave. OK, so, <laughs> so I want to describe it in a way of how our expectation change uh, what we experience. And as you can probably tell, I was uh, in hospital for, for a long time. I was a burn patient, a very tough injury, lots of, lots of pain. And at the time in hospital, the doctors would give us a, a portion, a, like a, a quota of painkillers we could take. And every day, we had our quota of how much we could take. And we, as the patients, could decide when we want to have the painkillers throughout, throughout the day. Mostly, it was morphine. And uh, because we had this limited amount, uh, a big part of our day was dedicated to thinking about when we should take different medications. And I, I was tracking this very obsessively and thinking about when is the next time and how long can I wait and so on. Um, and sometimes at night, I would hear one of my fellow patients cry, and the nurse would go to their room and give them something, and they would go to sleep. And I not only tracked my own uh, painkillers, I tracked other people's. I'm that uh, obsessive. So I would track how much other people would take. And I would call the nurse, and I said, I think that this person got more than their <laughs> portion. Uh, I want some extra, too. <laughs> and sometimes the nurses would tell me that they gave them placebo. They said they gave them an IV fluid, just saline water, some water with some salt. And you know, it's one thing to read about placebos and to uh, kind of understand a little bit about them. It's a completely different thing to be, to have lots of pain, to know that somebody in the room next to you is having similar pain, and to hear them getting an injection with nothing but saline water, and for them to go to sleep. And I became very interested in this notion of placebo, about the fact that if you think about something in a certain way, it can actually become reality. And I read about placebos. And one way to think about placebo is about Pavlov's dog. So you remember the story, right? Pavlov's dog would get a bell a sound, then some meat, and then they would start salivating. And they would get this sequence for a long time until after a while, the salivation started coming before the meat. The bell was sufficient to create the salivation, the physiological reaction. And placebos are very similar. You see a physician injecting you something, whatever it is, your body thinks it's going to be a painkiller. And because of that, your body starts secreting already a substance that is very much like morphine. So whether you're getting it from the doctor or not, your body anticipates this new reality prepares the body for this new reality, and your physiology changes, and therefore you actually have some pain relief. And of course, we all know it in food, right? You go to a restaurant, you anticipate some food, your body already starts secreting, you have saliva, your stomach acidity changes, things happen to prepare for that. Our brains in general prepare for our future, and when something happens that changes our outlook for the future, our physiology can change to accommodate for that. And that's basically the notion for placebo for pain. It's real. 
in the sense that we have these opioids that our bo body secretes, but it doesn't have to come from an outside view. So a physician can inject you something and then placebo can start. Sadly, you can't close your eyes and say, please, 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 I want some medications. I want some pain relief, but if a physician does something, you have this physiological reaction. So at the time, I was doing lots of experiments on pricing, uh, looking at what happens when people get something, pay a lot or pay a little or get something for free. And I decided to marry those two topics, my interest in placebo and my interest in pricing. So I invented a new pain medication called Validon RX. I made pens and a logo and a brochure. <laughs> and I invited people to come to the lab. I connected them to a device, to their wrist, that would give them electrical shocks. And we gave people a set of electrical shocks. And for each of them, we asked them to, to report back how much pain they could tolerate when it was getting too strong, too much to bear. And then we gave them a painkiller. We gave them a Validon RX which of course was nothing but a sugar pill, but it had you know, the nice logo and the pen and everything. <laughs> and then we waited 15 minutes, gave them old Newsweek and Time magazine to really feel like you're in a doctor's office. <laughs> <clears throat> and then we tested them again with the same set of electrical shocks to see what happens to their ability to withstand pain. Did it go down? Did it go up? Did it stay the same? And we had four different types of ways to describe Validon RX. To half the people, we said it was expensive. To half the people, we said it was cheap. And within that, to half the people, we told it was made in the US. And to half the people, we told it was made in China. So we had four groups. Some people thought it was an expensive pill make, made in the US, cheap pill made in the US, expensive medication made in China, cheap medication made in China. And what happened? The first thing we saw was that an expensive medication has a much bigger placebo effect than a cheap medication. Right? It relieved more, more pain than a cheap one. What about, about the Chinese versus American? No difference. Now, that surprised me at some, at some level. I expected it to, to have an effect. Um, but at the same time, Chinese medicine has this halo effect. There's all kinds of things that people believe in. So maybe it didn't have my expected uh, effect on that. Anyway, so that was the first thing uh, we got. And you can think about all kinds of uh, implication of these results. For example, what happens when you get a really expensive medication, but you don't know it's that expensive? Because of your low copay, you think it's just very cheap. Or what happens if we give some people free medication because they need them and they, we don't tell them about the price? Could it be the fact that by not mentioning the price and reducing it, we're making things less salient? In fact, you can think about lots of things we do with medications. For example, we take medications that companies spend a ton of money on branding, and then we give them in ugly brown bottles. Right? Are we actually reducing something about people's expectations? If you think that expectations actually drive something about reality, are we doing lots of things with our mechanical view of life that takes away these expectations? Um, if you think about Mario's talk, a lot of it had to do with all kinds of expectations he gets to develop within, within people. The next step of this uh, didn't involve medication. Uh, it involved beer. Um, we came to a group of people, and we said, please taste two types of beer. We'll call one beer A and one beer B. Taste them both, and then tell us which one you like better. People tasted both of them. They said which one they liked. Now, what the people in the experiment did not know was that one of them was regular beer. The other one was the same beer with balsamic vinegar. Now, who, which one do you think they liked better, the one with vinegar or without vinegar? The vast majority liked the one with, with vinegar. It was much preferred. You know, it added some texture and bitterness and so on. Anyway, the beer was better. And just so you know, we did it with uh, Budweiser, which might not be a big surprise that you can help uh, Budweiser. <laughs> but uh, we did it also with Sam Adams, right? a, a, richer, a richer beer. Anyway, um, in another version of the experiment, we gave people the same beers, but this time we told them about it up front. Here's a regular beer. Here's the same beer with balsamic vinegar. Try them both. Tell us which one you want a big glass of. What do you think happened now? Now people hated the one with balsamic vinegar. Now this is again about the role of expectation. 
It says that when you don't know that there's vinegar in there, you like it, but you, when you anticipate that this is going to be an awful experience, it does become an awful experience. Now, here's the question that came out of this. Imagine that you have this force of anticipation and you have the force of taste experience. How do the two of them add up together? Is it simply that you say, I anticipate that this would be terrible, but my taste buds are telling me that this is good and this just adds up? Or is there a more intricate interplay between the two of them? So we did another version of the experiment in which we first asked people to taste the two beers and then before they made their choice, we said, just so you know, this one is a regular beer, this one has balsamic vinegar, which one do you want now? Now here's the thing. If you basically do a computation that says, oh, it has vinegar, I expect it to be terrible, and my taste bud tells me it's good, maybe it doesn't matter if you do it before or after. If those two sources of information, our anticipation and our experience are independent and we just end them, add them up, it doesn't matter if you find out before or after. However, if the way we expect something to be actually colors the way we experience something, then having anticipation before or after the experience will matter dramatically. Right? So if you expect to that something will be terrible in advance and it changes how you taste it, that would uh, change it one way. So what do you think happened? What happens when people taste as if they're in the blind tasting condition, they don't know what's happening, and they're being told about it later. Does it behave like the blind tasting, or does it behave like the one where people knew? It's very similar to the blind tasting, right? So that suggests that when we know something up front, it changes the way we experience something. When you anticipate that the beer would be terrible, it is in fact terrible. And if you tasted it and only later you learn that it was had balsamic vinegar, it doesn't actually change anything. This is why, by the way, it's good to tell your kids, taste it and I'll tell you what it is later. This is a good way to get them to eat broccoli. <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Um, all of these thoughts about how anticipation changes experience got us to do a whole nother uh, set of experiments. Uh, we've been doing experiments trying to see how different consumer products are expect, uh, affected by our expectations. So for example, we give people sunglasses and we ask them to read through a very bright screen to see if they can read anything through it, something that is very, very tough. And what we find is that when we give them some glasses and we tell them that they are like cheap knockoff, uh, people do worse in this. When we tell them this is a high brand name, we use our money in some of them, uh, people do, uh, do better. When we give people headsets, and we tell them that these headsets are a very high quality brand and they're supposed to filter noise out of the environment. And what we do is we play them a tape of, of sounds and they have to read back to us the words that were being said to them and they get paid according to the performance. Nevertheless, their anticipation about the quality of the headsets influence their ability to read and therefore the amount of money uh, that they make. And in all of those experiences, it's really this amazing idea that when you anticipate something to happen in the world, there's a good chance it will happen. And for me, the placebo effect and all of those anticipation effects really give us a new sense of understanding of how the body and the mind kind of interacts, right? We have, we have this model of body and mind and people have different ideology about it and different uh, feelings about it, but the placebo effect actually tells you that the way your mind works, the way your anticipation uh, operates, can actually change your physiology, can actually change how you view something, how you feel it, how you uh, behave, um, what is happening. And, and I'll finish just with uh, t telling you one thing. There's a, a story in the literature on kind of uh, the B Baron Mühlhausen, was a German hero, he was a guy, kind of an odd guy who was running around doing all kinds of things and one day he went into a swamp and he was starting to sink in the swamp and he held his own hair and he pulled himself up. And not only did he pull himself up, he was holding his horse between his legs and he was able to pull. He was so strong he could pull his horse up as well. And of course this is not uh, possible. Um, 
But I think the metaphor for me is that we are able to some degree to pull ourselves from, from our hair. We are able through uh, thinking about life in a different way actually change the reality that we experience. And you know, I'm not sure if this is a, this path I drew for you through this research exploration is creative or not, maybe just create uh, rather than creative, at least partially. But it is about how, I think for me, I start with some personal experience, something I view the world and something I want to try and change and understand a little bit better. And it's also tell you something about the own uh, creating process of our own minds and how we, through that, change our reality and physiology. Oh, oh, actually, can I have one moment? I do want to say one thing. You, you missed a great introduction because I know we stopped with masturbation on the last one, but we actually have some great research on that. Uh, <laughs> So I did, I did a study on trying to see how being uh, aroused changes the decision making of young uh, men. Um, so we basically gave men uh, three decision categories. We gave them a whole range of sexual activities, all the way from just kissing to having contacts with animals, like really a big range. <laughs> And we asked them to tell us how much they would enjoy each of those when they're aroused. Then we asked them questions about uh, all the way from would you tell a woman you love her even if you don't to increase the chance she'll go to bed with you, all the way to drugging and getting women to drink and, and having date rape. And then we asked them also questions about condom use. But in all cases, we said, how likely are you to do this when aroused? That was one group. Then we took the same people, but also some new people, and we didn't just ask them how they behave, we also gave them an experience of arousal. Uh, we gave them laptops with some pornography. Um, we asked them to examine this pornography and to um, self-entertain themselves. They, we asked them to uh, masturbate. <clears throat> and we asked them to masturbate to a degree that they did not come, but they were close. And to keep that while answering the questions. By the way, there's some technical details. We gave them a one-handed keyboard. A com <laughs> the computers had ceram wrap, but... <laughs> and again, we asked them to tell us how they would behave when aroused. Now, here's the thing. Both groups were asked to report how they would behave when aroused, but one did not have the benefit of being aroused, and the other one did. And what happened, they were very different. You know, in some sense, we all know that when we're aroused, we're different people, but the results show that people do not appreciate the extent to which we would be different people. So while in the cold state, the uh, more rational state, they said we will never treat women this badly, we'll always get a condom, and we don't enjoy these strange activities, in the hot state, men were very, very different. They, they were, but the important thing, they were different beyond what they recognize. Uh, up front. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>